Zhang Li has been elected the chief executive designate of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region with landslide support. This is the first chief executive election since amendments were made to the city's electoral system in March 2021. What does the election mean for the city and how representative is the newly elected leader? And with less than two months to go before John Lee is sworn into his new role on July the 1st, which also marks the 25th anniversary of the city's return to Chinese rule, what can we expect? What will happen to the city's democracy? Is it being eroded? Welcome to this special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, coming to you from Beijing. I'm pleased to be joined by Mrs. Regina Ip Lao Suk Ki, member of the Hong Kong SAR Executive and Legislative Council, and also chairperson of the New People's Party. Mrs. Ip, thank you very much for joining us from Hong Kong. First of all, we've heard a lot of reactions from Western governments and the mainstream Western media commentators who seem to be extremely unhappy with the results coming from the latest CE election. Uh, what is your understanding of the reason why they're so unhappy about how things have been going? Well, they, they were commenting on the basis of Western norms about uh, the political system, that there ought to be competitive election, more than one uh, candidate and political pluralism, that sort of thing. But we need to work out our own system in accordance with the basic law. And this is the first chief executive election uh, implemented under our improved electoral system. You know? I don't think we should be judged solely on the basis of Western norms. You know. Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China, and we ought to work out our own political system in accordance with our country's constitution and our basic law, and in accordance with the practical needs of our society. Would you elaborate a little bit just now you talk about not basing the judgment on Western norms uh, or Western democratic values, but uh, based on the norms and the reality and the needs of the city of Hong Kong. Uh, what specifically are you talking about and why are they different, at least uh, on the surface to a certain extent with the West? For example, there have been repeated complaints about um, so-called violation of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. But I must stress that there is no reference whatsoever to democracy or universal suffrage in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. One country, two systems is a reunification project. In 1982, when um, the two countries started to negotiate about the future of, China, of Hong Kong, we were, in fact, an autocracy. You know, we were governed by London appointed governors. The Legislative Council was made up of appointed or official members. There was no, there was never democracy in Hong Kong. In fact, under the basic law, Beijing has allowed us to elect more universal suffrage based members in the, uh, in the legislature. And in uh, August uh, 2014, uh, Beijing approved a plan for moving toward universal suffrage-based election of the chief executive. But that was rejected by the self-styled Democrats in the legislature. So I think it is really unfair of Western nations to complain about lack of democracy in Hong Kong. In fact, we have become far more democratic since 1997. And it is for us to work out our own political system. I want to also lay out the groundwork a little bit because before we move into further about the discussion of universal suffrage, uh, we have heard so much about the new national security law for Hong Kong and how it's stifling press freedom, for instance. But when I talked to the current incumbent chief executive, she actually told me the number of journalists registered with the special administrative region have actually gone up. I mean, if people are, are fearful of the kind of environment that they work in, they certainly wouldn't have stayed in the country. How do you explain that? Well, what Mrs. Lam said is absolutely correct. You know, they continue to be highly uh, vibrant and um, 
um, reporting on Hong Kong, whether on COVID or on the CE election by Western media, they are well represented in Hong Kong. You know? So um, the, the government has only taken action against those who are suspected of violating our new national security law. The rest of the media are still functioning effectively, whether local or foreign. Um, there's also the fear that uh, after the national security law, there would be an exodus of capital from the city of Hong Kong because of the changed environment. And obviously, uh, a year later to um, and longer after that, we haven't seen such a thing. And this is widely reported by the international media as well. What do you think cemented the international confidence in the city of Hong Kong? Because as a special administrative region, we have the rule of law. We have a common law system with strong foundations. Even though two British justices decided to step down on our court of final appeal because of pressure from British politicians, you know, um, I think nine overseas permanent justices, non-permanent justices from uh, common law jurisdictions, including um, um, Madam Justice um, McLaughlin from uh, Canada, Lord Sumption from UK, and a lot of other distinguished jurors continue to serve in Hong Kong. Our legal system has a high reputation, and our Hong Kong dollar continues to be a freely convertible currency, and we have a free market system. So I don't think foreign uh, business confidence in Hong Kong's market-based system is shaken at all. So the, free of, uh, the flow of funds continue to be unimpeded and there is no outflow whatsoever. You also talk about rule of law and I checked with uh, the latest World Justice Project, for instance, for the year 2021, Hong Kong's standing in terms of the level of rule of law actually remained unchanged, standing at 19th place out of 139 countries and jurisdictions around the world. And that's very much comparable to the UK, for instance, at the 16th place and Singapore 17th. Um, so it seems there's a gap between what is portrayed of where the city is, direct, is, is heading versus what has actually happened on the ground. And according to International Barometer, exactly um, why is Hong Kong able to retain the status in terms of rule of law and what has enabled that? Well, uh, you're right, you know, we're ranked 19, we are seven places above the US, you know, assessment of US system. Um, because we continue to have an independent judiciary, you know, uh, we have open and transparent court proceedings. All the safeguards of human rights like uh, habeas corpus, judicial review, legal aid continue to be functioning well, you know, and our judges are of high quality, you know. Uh, the fact that um, there is no outflow of funds whatsoever and there continues to be a lot of business interest in Hong Kong speak volumes about the confidence in our rules-based system. Now, help people understand this latest CE election against the background that I've just talked about. Um, because after all, Mr. Zhang Li was the only nominee. He was not the only one who entered in the race, but he got the only nomination. And he got 99% of all the total valid votes. That's uh, 14, 16 in total in support of him. So some people are saying, you know, such a single man race with such a landslide victory reeks of a rigged game. What is your comment? Exactly what explains that he's the, the only nominee and that he has such an overwhelming majority? Um, John is indeed the candidate with the largest majority in the past 15 years. You have to bear in mind um, the pool of candidates for the chief executive job in Hong Kong, which is a highly demanding one, because the chief executive implements one country, two systems. You navigate two systems. You know. The pool of candidates is by nature limited. You know. um, from past uh, experience, they tend to come from the civil service because they are conversant with how to operate the system. So it's a small wonder that only one candidate the number two in government uh, came forward. Uh, don't forget, 
he is the third candidate who has served as chief secretary, you know. So it's obvious, it's quite obvious, you really need a lot of government experience. So I'm not surprised at all that only Mr. Lee came forward. In terms of the landslide support he got, I mean, 99% of the total number of votes, um, is it out of no choice or is it out of genuine expectation, confidence in him that he can do a job unifying the society and bringing it forward? Um, first of all, there were, there were a few um, do not support votes. And um, I think there were some blank votes altogether, about 12. So it's just definitely a system which allows people to uh, voice their choice. You know? uh, so it's not a rigged system. You know, uh, Mr. Lee was elected with 14, 16 votes. You know? um, but in fact, we were, uh, as election committee members, we were relieved that finally we have a candidate who can unify the pro-establishment camp. From past experience, you know, the 2012 election and the 2017 election, the outcomes were actually quite concerning in that we have too much infighting within our own camp. Now, it is important for the next chief to be able to heal the rift in our society. And it is a good thing he starts with healing the rift within the pro-establishment camp and then gradually reach out to the wider community. I think this is a good beginning. Um, for a lot of people, the election system in Hong Kong is nothing is not something that they're very familiar with. And it's definitely not the kind of one, one person, one vote that people imagine. Actually, in the United States, it's not a direct uh, universal suffrage either. You don't directly vote for the candidate you want. You vote for the um, for, you know, uh, an indirect system, which then selects the, the president of the United States. So how does Hong Kongers exactly choose their CE. What, help us understand the system a little bit. Hong Kongers choose through the election committee, uh, which has five sectors representing commerce, industry, finance, the professionals, the grassroots community organizations, uh, the Hong Kong branches of mainland organizations, and the political class, that is, uh, legislators. Uh, the 36 delegates to Hong Kong delegates to the National People's Congress and the CPPCC members, members of the Chinese Political uh, Consultative Conference, you know. And it's actually similar to the UK or US system. The, the British Prime Minister is elected by the MPs, you know, he's not directly elected. The majority party chooses the leader and the leader becomes the, the Prime Minister. Similarly, in the, in the US, you know, the president is elected by the electoral college. Of course, you can say that the electors in the electoral college uh, are elected by popular ballot. But again, the pool of candidates is very limited. In the US, you need to have a lot of funds. We all know that if you cannot raise funds, you are out, you know. Again, even in the US, where you are supposed to have an open democratic system, the poor candidates very limited, you know, they tend to come from a few families, the Kennedys, you know, the Clintons, you know, uh, and um, Trump's name is uh, popping up again and again. So everywhere, all over the world, people who are really qualified to take the reins at the top is very limited. Hong Kong is no different. And, and, and yet, uh, although it was not a perfect system uh, by now until Mrs. Carrie Lam, we, Hong Kong have had five chief executives elected through the, the, the uh, previous system, although not perfect. You say the results were concerning. And yet, um, we've had people, by and large, were able to govern the city patriotic enough. And why the changes in March last year that made it necessary for the CE to be selected or elected in a different manner? Um, we've always, it take the legislature, for example, we've always had a diversity of opinion. It's okay for some to be more liberal and others to be more conservative, that's fine. But over time, the 
the most so-called democratic bloc, they literally became anti-China, anti-China's sovereignty on Hong Kong, anti-government and, and actually anti-development. They voted against everything, anything to do a connection with the mainland, high-speed rail, national anthem, national uh, flag, you know, and uh, they voted even against funding and anti-epidemic funds to help those affected by COVID, you know, and they resorted to extreme filibuster tactics that held back government business. The government could not move forward to tackle a lot of really pressing livelihood problems, such as our extreme land and housing shortage. So we had to, Beijing had to overhaul our system, you know, and make sure those who are elected are true patriots in the sense that they do uphold the basic law and do bear allegiance to the special administrative region. It's as simple as that, you know. Uh, the um, reform uh, introduced last March introduced a mechanism for verifying the qualifications of the candidates to weed out those who only pay lip service uh, to our, our country and actually do all sorts of things that uh, oppose connection with our motherland. You know, that's not viable for Hong Kong. People would argue, though, that uh, um, in the subsector election, which is election to some members of the election committee, um, the result of the 1,500 members to the election committee is that uh, the so-called pro-democratic camp basically had very little representation. For instance, the, some of the bigger parties that were in the so-called pro-democracy camp uh, did not participate in that election. So they were challenging the representativeness of the election committee. Um, although there were people who were against China, who were anti-China, who were calling for extreme uh, anti-China tactics and ideology, but there is, you cannot deny that, a large section of the Hong Kong society who are not happy with how things were being done or how their life was uh, progressing. How are their voices um, possibly heard and included in the future government? Um, members of the so-called pan-democratic bloc, some were um, screened out by the uh, um, qualification verification mechanism. Uh, some were being charged with national security offenses. Some simply choose, chose not to take part. It is their own choice because this is a new system. In future, when the system has settled down, I hope, I do hope that people who hold different opinions from myself, for example, they would participate. Over time, when people who hold different opinions from, from the pro-establishment bloc uh, found out that the system, new system introduced actually works well for Hong Kong, we are moving ahead to solve a lot of practical problems like retirement protection. I hope they will participate. Uh, to speak for their constituents. I myself, I speak for the minorities. I speak for the LGBT uh, uh, people. Uh, I speak for the ethnic communities, you know. Uh, other sectors of the public, they are free to approach me or any of my colleagues to voice their concerns. What will not be allowed in the future though? Because in the past, it was kind of a game without a rule. Um, very much you can oppose the, the rule of the central government of the ruling party of China. But what will be the red line from the future? What will be allowed and tolerated? What would not be allowed? Well, in the legislature, we have rules of procedure. And we have um, our procedures are, are similar to the procedures of other parliament. For example, if you misbehave in the sense of uh, using offensive words or throwing things, in the legislature, throwing bottles, you know, rotten plants, you will be thrown out. Uh, these people should, these uh, representatives should be fined, you know, um, like in other legislature, you know, so they have to abide by rules of the, the legislature. You know, in the wider community, we have national security law. You can say anything unless you are, you infringe 
laws about incitement, inciting hatred against the country or the government, inciting hatred against the police force or the judiciary. You know, our sedition laws we have inherited from Britain, you know, uh, Commonwealth uh, jurisdictions have similar uh, legal provisions. What about the unique role of the chief executive once again? Because Hong Kong is not an independent unity. It is not an ind independent polity. It is part of China. So the chief executive is top office of that specific region, and yet it has also to obey, listen and obey the directives of the central government as stipulated in the basic law. Many people ignore that, but uh, they, the, the chief executive is really um, has to, you know, obey the directives of the central government. So what kind of unique role is the CE? That is not fully understood, I'm afraid, by many people outside of China. That's a very good question, you know. A lot of people are not aware of the um, twin obligations of the chief executive. Under Article 43 of our basic law, the chief executive is accountable to the central government. He is appointed by the central government, but he's also accountable to the people of Hong Kong. You know? So on the one hand, he has to uphold the sovereignty, security, and developmental interests of our country. That's why Beijing has introduced the offense of collusion with uh, foreign or external forces to undermine uh, national security. And on the other hand, he or she also need to um, bolster the unique advantages of Hong Kong within the nation, which is we have a far more open and international environment we are highly convergent with the rest of the world in terms of our systems. Uh, we have a common law system. Uh, and um, so we, have an, we are an open and transparent society with an independent judiciary. Uh, these are our unique advantages compared to the other parts of China. So I think um, um, the chief executive needs to uphold all these advantages. Which direction is the city heading now? Because the outside critics are saying, look, there is less democracy, erosion of the democracy, grave concerns, so on and so forth. How do you see the, 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 the direction of the city now? Well, all these critics are purely commenting on demo the demo democracy from the point of view of the process of selection. What we want to um, stress is the outcomes any political system is uh, welcomed by the people only if the system delivers the outcome sought by the people, like resolving our housing problem, our retirement protection problem, our wealth gap problem. You know, in the past, our, our political system had been too hobbled by infighting, bickering, you know, polarization, filibustering, so that we cannot get things done. We need to correct that. You know, in terms of fighting COVID, you know, we, are, we have succeeded in bringing the numbers down to triple digits, hovering between 200 and 300. Uh, the number of fatalities have fallen a lot, and we are opening up, you know, reconnecting with the rest of the world. But I think the new chief executive will still need to strive hard to uh, reopen our control points with mainland China and with Macau. You know, we are part of China to be, you know, uh, isolated from the rest of our country. That is not sustainable long term. So while we want to reconnect with the rest of the world, we also want to reconnect with the mainland. And that is uh, the most pressing task of the new chief executive. I want to get back to that in just a moment, but I do want to touch upon the universal suffrage uh, ultimate goal that's stipulated in the basic law. Basically, the past five CEs were also chosen more or less by this election committee. And right now, this revamped election committee is also choosing John Lee as the next one. Um, so is, is the goal the ultimate goal of universal suffrage based on the broadly representative nominating committee of Hong Kong? Is that still within reach. Is that still um, realistic for the future, for the near future of Hong Kong? 
the basic law says universal suffrage is the ultimate aim. Right. Based on two preconditions. In the light of actual situation, for example, as in if it is if we have widespread riots, violent riots, as in 2019, clearly not feasible to implement universal suffrage, or or if we have a pandemic, you know, in the light of actual situation, or and in accordance with the principle of orderly and gradual progress, you know, these are the clear preconditions spelled out in the basic law. So it is still there. In fact, Beijing's offer is still on the table. You know, the National People's Congress Standing Committee made a decision on 31st August 2014 offering Hong Kong people universal suffrage based elections for the chief executive subject to nomination by a nominating committee. Now that was rejected by the Pan Democratic Bloc. You know, we could have had grasped it. Um, in 204, in 2015, they rejected it. It's their choice. They made the best, the enemy of the good. It's a pity. So people cannot take the word universal suffrage out of its context and uh, purely talk about it as if, you know, it, it is uh, the same as in a Western society, one person, one vote. Uh, finally, I have just enough time to ask you about your assessment of Zhang Li's uh, immediate challenge. What do you think is his biggest obstacle and how well placed is him is he in achieving these obstacles well currently i think he's working hard to form his new cabinet you know his team of ministers when he has taken and he's implementing a government reorganization plan which we have talked about for more than 10 years it's high time to um, restructure do some restructuring and when he has taken over the, the job taken up the reins. I think the most pressing task is um, reopening our boundary with the mainland, you know, uh, because we have not only strong business uh, commercial ties with mainland China, but a lot of people to people bonds. A lot of families have been split for more than two years. There has been a lot of suffering. A, lo a lot of people want to be reunited with their families in the mainland and uh, quarantine free travel even subject to a quota would be highly desirable so i think john will be working on that and then of course you need to solve our housing problems and all that right it's a it's a daunting task and he doesn't have uh, too much time because people are all expecting something to come out of his administration as soon as possible we'll see uh, many thanks to honorable rikina ip lao suki member of uh, hong kong sar executive and legislative council and also chairperson of the new people's party thank you for joining us thank you it's a pleasure and with that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching and you've got The Point.